Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another iceberg video. This one is the Renaissance era iceberg and is a good sequel of sorts to the medieval iceberg I made a bit ago. This iceberg, which is made by Elementi Fire XD, will be examining all types of Renaissance era topics, artwork, famous people of the era, and theories, just to name a few. Some of the entries may not be in the era typically associated with the Renaissance, but they are all generally pretty close, except maybe a few. But real quick before we begin, thank you all so much for the support on all my other videos. I truly appreciate it, and if you want to like and subscribe, I will be uploading more historical icebergs and related videos about history in the future. Anyway, this iceberg is pretty big at over 130 entries, and it's all pretty interesting. So without further ado, let's get into it and begin this iceberg. Starting Tier 1 and the iceberg, we have Florence. Florence, situated in the Tuscany region of Italy, was a pivotal cultural, artistic, and economic center during the Renaissance period. The influential Medici family played a crucial role in patronizing artists, scholars, and architects, thereby influencing Florence's cultural development. Artists such as Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Sandro Botticelli were active in Florence during this era, producing iconic art. Florence's mercantile economy, supported by its strategic position along trade routes, facilitated the exchange of ideas and goods during the Renaissance. Today, Florence remains a significant cultural destination, attracting visitors from around the globe who come to admire its art, architecture, and rich history. Leonardo da Vinci, born in 1452 in Vinci, Italy, was a Renaissance figure whose talents spanned various fields including painting, sculptures, architecture, engineering, and anatomy. He is widely regarded as one of the greatest artists of all time, with masterpieces such as the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper showcasing his technique. Beyond his artistic achievements, da Vinci's notebooks reveal a scientific curiosity and pioneering spirit as he explored concepts ranging from human anatomy to flying machines. His approach to knowledge exemplified the spirit of the Renaissance, and his work continues to inspire and influence generations of artists, scientists, and thinkers. Michelangelo Buonarroti, born in 1475 in Caprice, Italy, was a Renaissance artist known for his contribution to the arts. His sculptures, including the iconic David and the Paeta, demonstrate his skill in rendering human form with great detail. Michelangelo's art in the Sistine Chapel, notably the ceiling depicting scenes from Genesis, showcases his mastery of composition and perspective. In addition to his art, he also made significant contributions to architecture most notably with his design of the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. He is remembered alongside other greats as well, Leonardo da Vinci, Donatello, and Raphael. Dante Alighieri, born in 1265 in Florence, Italy, was a prominent poet of the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. His most famous work, The Divine Comedy, is considered one of the greatest literary achievements in the Italian language. Comprising three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, this epic poem follows Dante's journey through hell, purgatory, and heaven, exploring themes of sin, redemption, and love. Written in vernacular Italian rather than Latin, the Divine Comedy played a big role in shaping modern Italian literature. Dante's vivid imagery and great storytelling cemented his status as a towering figure in literary history, and we touched on Dante in the previous Iceberg videos as well. The Mona Lisa is a renowned portrait painted by Leonardo da Vinci during the Renaissance period, believed to have been completed between 1503 and 1506. Housed in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, the painting is one of the most famous, if not the most famous, paintings ever. The identity of the subject depicted in the portrait remains subject of debate among some art historians, although many speculate it that she was Lisa Gherardini, the wife of a Florentine merchant. The Mona Lisa has a huge amount of fame behind it, becoming an enduring symbol of beauty and artistic mastery with Leonardo's techniques and very impressive attention to detail. The Vitruvian Man is a famous drawing by Leonardo da Vinci created around 1490. It depicts a male figure in two superimposed positions with arms and legs outstretched inside a square and a circle. The drawing is based on the writings of the Roman architect Vitruvius, who described ideal proportions for the human body in relation to architectural design. Leonardo's Vitruvian Man symbolizes the concept of man as the measure of all things, highlighting the harmony between the human form and the universe. The drawing shows Leonardo's fascination with anatomy, geometry, and the intersection of art and science during the Renaissance. The Vitruvian Man is recognized as an iconic representation of the beauty and symmetry found in nature. Christopher Columbus, born in Genoa, Italy around 1451, was a navigator and explorer whose voyages across the Atlantic Ocean opened the door to European exploration and colonization of the Americas. In 1492, he sailed westwards from Spain in search of a shorter route to Asia, though ultimately landing in the Bahamas. Columbus's voyages marked the beginning of sustained contact between Europe and the Americas, while Columbus may not have discovered the New World, he undoubtedly was the one who opened the door for a whole new way of life for the entire world, basically. The 95 Theses were a set of propositions written by Martin Luther in 1517, criticizing certain practices within the Catholic Church. 
Luther's action of posting the theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, is often cited as the catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. In the theses, Luther called for theological debate and reform within the church, challenging the authority of the Pope and questioning the doctrine of purgatory, among more. The 95 Theses were widely circulated thanks to the invention of the printing press, sparking widespread discussion and debate across Europe. Luther's defiance of the Church's teachings ultimately led to his excommunication, but his ideas inspired the formation of Protestantism on a huge scale. Next up, we have Johannes Gutenberg, which we talked about him on the Medieval Iceberg, and before we go much further, there's going to be some overlap with the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance era, as they're still debated when the two eras came and went. But anyway, Johannes Gutenberg, born around 1400 in Mainz, Germany, was a key figure in the development of the printing press during the 15th century. His invention of movable type printing revolutionized the production of books and other printed materials. Gutenberg's most famous work is the Gutenberg Bible, printed around 1455, which was one of the first major books printed using movable type in Europe. The printing press dramatically increased the speed and efficiency of book production, making written knowledge more accessible and affordable. Gutenberg's invention is often credited with sparking the Renaissance and the Reformation by facilitating the dissemination of ideas and information. David is a renowned work of art from the Renaissance. It is a sculpture created by the Italian artist Michelangelo between 1501 and 1504. The sculpture depicts the biblical hero David who famously defeated the giant Goliath with a sling and a stone. Michelangelo's David has impressive craftsmanship and a lifelike depiction of the human form. Carved from a single block of marble, the sculpture stands over 17 feet tall and exemplifies the Renaissance ideals of beauty, strength, and virtue. David was originally commissioned as a symbol of the Republic of Florence's defiance against the external threats and political turmoil, and today the statue is housed in the Academia Gallery in Florence, Italy. The Last Supper is one of the most iconic paintings of the Renaissance period and of all time. Created by Leonardo da Vinci between 1495 and 1498, the mural depicts the scene of Jesus Christ's last meal with his apostles, as described in the Gospel of John. Housed in the refectory of the Covenant of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milan, Italy, the painting measures approximately 15 feet by 29 feet. Leonardo's use of perspective, composition, and facial expressions are remarkable, even to this day, and are extremely impressive. Despite suffering from deterioration over the centuries, The Last Supper remains a masterpiece of Western art and a testament to Leonardo's genius. The painting's enduring popularity has made it one of the most recognizable and studied works of art in history. William Shakespeare, born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, was an English playwright, poet, and actor widely regarded as one of the greatest writers in the English language and the world's preeminent dramatist. He wrote approximately 39 plays, 154 sonnets, and two long narrative poems over the course of his career. Shakespeare's works, which include tragedies like Hamlet and Macbeth and King Lear, comedies like A Midsummer's Night's Dream and Twelfth Night, and histories like Henry V and Richard III explore themes of love, power, ambition, and the human condition. Shakespeare's legacy continues to influence literature, theater, and the arts, making him one of the most celebrated figures in world literature. Romeo and Juliet is one of William Shakespeare's most famous plays, believed to have been written between 1591 and 1595. It tells the tragic story of two young lovers, Romeo Montague and Juliet Capulet, whose romance is doomed by their feuding families. Set in the Italian city of Verona, and despite their family's enmity, Romeo and Juliet fall deeply in love and secretly marry, but their happiness is short-lived as a series of misunderstandings and unfortunate events lead to their untimely deaths. Yeah, spoiler alert, they both die, I'm sorry. It remains one of the most performed and adapted works of literature to this day. The Protestant Reformation was a religious movement in the 16th century that aimed to reform the Catholic Church and resulted in the establishment of Protestantism on a wide scale. It was sparked by Martin Luther's posting of the 95 Theses, which we covered a bit, Luther's ideas which emphasized salvation through faith alone and the authority of scripture over papal decrees spread rapidly across Europe, leading to widespread religious and social upheaval. The Reformation saw the rise of various Protestant denominations, including Lutheranism, Calvinism, and Anglicanism, each with its own theological doctrines and practices. The Creation of Adam is one of the most famous frescoes by Michelangelo, painted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Vatican City between 1508 and 1512. The fresco depicts the biblical scene from the book of Genesis, in which God breathes life into Adam, the first man. The iconic image of God reaching out to touch Adam's finger has become one of the most recognizable and reproduced artworks in history. The fresco is celebrated for its profound symbolism and theological significance, reflecting the Renaissance ideals of humanism, divine inspiration, and the relationship between humanity and the divine. 
Hamlet is one of William Shakespeare's most famous tragedies, believed to have been written between 1599 and 1601. The play follows the story of Prince Hamlet of Denmark, who seeks revenge against his uncle, King Claudius, for murdering his father and marrying his mother. The character of Hamlet is known for his introspection, indecision, and philosophical soliloquies, including the famous lines, to be or not to be, that is the question. The Divine Comedy, which we basically already explained when we covered Dante, is an epic poem divided into three separate parts where Dante travels through a different realm in Catholic theology, hell, purgatory, and heaven. There's not too much else to be said really on this. I of course recommend the Wendigoon video on it. He does a very in-depth dive on this story. Uh, also read it too, it's a very good book. The fall of Constantinople, which was covered in the medieval iceberg, is typically thought by many to be a good marker for the end of the Middle Ages and the start of the Renaissance, though of course there are arguments for and against this. But anyway, the fall of Constantinople occurred in 1453 when the city of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was captured by the Ottoman Turks under the command of Sultan Mehmed II. The siege of Constantinople lasted for nearly two months before the city's defenses were breached, leading to its eventual conquest on May 29, 1453. The fall of Constantinople marked the end of the Byzantine Empire, which had lasted for around a thousand years since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It also marked the beginning of Ottoman dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean and the closing of the traditional overland trade routes between Europe and Asia. The event had significant repercussions for European history, including the influx of Greek scholars and texts into Western Europe, which contributed to the Renaissance, as well as the age of exploration as Europeans sought new trade routes to Asia. Macbeth is also one of William Shakespeare's most famous tragedies, believed to have been written between 1603 and 1607. The play follows the story of Macbeth, a Scottish nobleman who was spurred by the prophecies of three witches and the ambition of his wife, Lady Macbeth, to murder King Duncan and seize the throne. However, Macbeth's ruthless pursuit of power leads to a spiral of violence, guilt, and madness, ultimately resulting in his downfall. Now onto our last entry for Tier 1 of the Iceberg, we have St. Peter's Basilica. St. Peter's Basilica is a super famous Renaissance era church located in Vatican City, the papal enclave within Rome, Italy. Designed by architects including Bramante, Michelangelo, and Bernini, it is one of the largest and most important churches in the world. Construction began in 1506 under Pope Julius II and was completed in 1626. St. Peter's Basilica is built over the burial site of St. Peter, one of the twelve apostles of Jesus, the one whom Jesus entrusted and built his church upon, making it an important pilgrimage site for Catholics and Christians. The Basilica's magnificent dome, designed by Michelangelo, is a prominent feature of the Rome skyline, and the Basilica tracks millions each year. Beginning Tier 2, we are starting with Ottaviano Petrucci. Born in Fossombrone, Italy around 1466, he was a renowned Italian music printer and publisher during the Renaissance. He is best known for his pioneering work in the field of music printing, particularly for his publication of the first significant collection of polyphonic music using movable type. Petrucci's most notable publication is the Harmonice Musicus ad Hecaton, printed in Venice in 1501, which contained 96 compositions by various composers. This collection played a crucial role in disseminating Renaissance music throughout Europe and establishing music printing as a viable industry. Petrucci's innovative printing techniques, including the use of three separate impressions for note heads, staves, and text, revolutionized music publishing and laid the foundation for future generation of music printers and publishers. The Ration on the Dignity of Man is a famous text written by Italian Renaissance philosopher Giovanni Pico della Mirandola in 1486. It is considered a seminal work of Renaissance humanism. In the oration, Pico celebrates the unique dignity and potential of humanity, arguing that humans possess the freedom to shape their own destiny and pursue knowledge across various disciplines. Pico emphasizes the greatness of humanity as the apex of creation, capable of transcending earthly limitations and aspiring to divine knowledge and wisdom. Niccolo Machiavelli, born in Florence, Italy in 1469, was a prominent Renaissance political philosopher, diplomat, and writer. His most famous work, The Prince, written in 1513, is a seminal treatise on politics and power. In The Prince, Machiavelli offers pragmatic advice to rulers on how to acquire and maintain political power, often advocating for ruthless tactics and the prioritization of statecraft over morality. Despite its controversial reputation, The Prince is considered a foundational text in political theory and has had a profound influence on Western political thought. Machiavelli's other notable works include Discourses on Livy and The Art of War. Don Quixote, written by Spanish author Miguel de Cervantes, is considered one of the greatest works of literature and a foundational text of Western literature. Published in two parts, one in 1605 and one in 1615, it tells the story of a nobleman named Alonso Quijano who becomes obsessed with chivalric romances and decides to become a knight-errant, renaming himself Don Quixote. 
Accompanied by his squire, Sancho Panza, Don Quixote embarks on misadventures, mistaking windmills for giants and inns for castles. Don Quixote is considered a classic of world literature and is also considered the first novel, and it is the best-selling one ever at that. I highly recommend the book, too. It's genuinely good and pretty funny. And the best English translation, I think, is by Edith Grossman. The Proto-Renaissance, also known as the Prelude to the Renaissance, refers to the transitional period in European art and culture between the Middle Ages and the full-fledged Renaissance. Merging in Italy during the 13th and 14th centuries, the Proto-Renaissance witnessed a revival of interest in classical art, literature, and learning. Artists began to experiment with new techniques, perspective, and realism, laying the groundwork for the artistic innovations that would characterize the Renaissance period. Notable figures of the Proto-Renaissance include Giotto di Bodone, whose frescoes in the Arena Chapel in Padua exemplify a departure from medieval art towards a more naturalistic style, and Dante Alighieri, whose Divine Comedy marked a significant literary achievement that would inspire Renaissance humanists. The Proto-Renaissance set the stage for the cultural rebirth that would unfold in the following centuries, marking a pivotal moment in the evolution of Western art and culture. Huldrych Zwingli, born in 1484 in Wildhaus, Switzerland, was a key figure in the Protestant Reformation and a leading reformer in Switzerland. Influenced by humanist ideas and the teachings of Erasmus, Zwingli advocated for reforms within the Catholic Church, challenging practices such as the sale of indulgences and the veneration of relics. As a priest in Zurich, he preached sermons emphasizing the primacy of scripture and the authority of the Bible over ecclesiastical traditions. Zwingli's teachings led to the establishment of a Protestant church in Zurich, marking the beginning of the Swiss Reformation. He also engaged in theological debates with other reformers, including Martin Luther, over issues such as the nature of the Eucharist, Luther still believing that it held the actual body of Christ. The Decameron is a collection of 100 novellas, or short stories, written by Italian author Giovanni Boccaccio in the 14th century. It is considered one of the masterpieces of Western literature and a seminal work of Renaissance literature. Set during the time of the Black Death in Florence, the Decameron follows a group of 10 young people who flee the city to escape the plague and take refuge in a villa in the countryside. To pass the time, they entertain each other by telling stories, ranging from body comedies to tragic romances, over the course of those 10 days. Francesco Petrarca, commonly known as Petrarch, was an Italian poet, scholar, and humanist who lived from 1304 to 1374, and he is often referred to as the father of humanism due to his role in reviving interest in classical literature and promoting the values of classical antiquity. Petrarch is best known for his poetry, particularly his sonnets, dedicated to his idealized love, Laura which are collected in his work Canzoniere, or Songbook. Petrarch was also a prolific scholar, writing extensively on subjects such as philosophy, history, and philology. His emphasis on the importance of studying classical texts laid the foundation for the humanist movement that would shape Renaissance thought. Marco Polo, who we talked about briefly in two of the previous icebergs, was a Venetian merchant who lived from 1254 to 1324. He is best known for his extensive travels and the book, The Travels of Marco Polo, which recounts his adventures in Asia. Polo embarked on his journey with his father and his uncle in 1271, traveling along the Silk Road to the court of Kublai Khan, the Mongol Emperor of China. He spent several decades in the service of the Khan, traveling throughout China and visiting regions such as India, Persia, and Southeast Asia. While some aspects of Polo's account have been questioned by historians, his travels have had significant impact on European exploration and commerce, though his travels were not as widely read at first, and it was not until after he passed that Europe became interested on a larger scale about what he had to say. The Pieta is a type of artistic representation depicting the Virgin Mary cradling the dead body of Jesus Christ after the crucifixion. The word Pieta is Italian for pity or compassion, and one of the most famous examples of the Pieta is a sculpture by Michelangelo, housed in St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. It depicts the youthful Mary holding the lifeless body of Jesus Christ. The Tragedy of Julius Caesar is a play written by William Shakespeare, believed to have been first performed in 1599. The play dramatizes the events surrounding the assassination of Julius Caesar, the Roman dictator, in 44 BC. The central characters include, of course, Julius Caesar, Brutus, Cassius, and Mark Antony. Brutus, a close friend of Caesar, is persuaded by Cassius to join a conspiracy to assassinate Caesar in order to prevent him from becoming a tyrant. However, the assassination leads to civil war and the downfall of the conspirators. Leo X, born Giovanni di Lorenzo di Medici in 1475, was Pope from 1513 until his death in 1521. He was a member of the prominent Medici family of Florence, and his papacy was characterized by a patronage of the arts. Leo X was a significant patron of Renaissance art and commissioned works by renowned artists such as Raphael and Michelangelo. However, his papacy was also marked by controversy, including criticism of his extravagant spending and the sale of indulgences to finance the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. 
Leo X's reign coincided with the rise of the Protestant Reformation, and his handling of the Reform Movement contributed to the division within the Catholic Church. He is perhaps best known for excommunicating Martin Luther in 1521. The School of Athens is one of the most famous frescoes by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael. Completed between 1509 and 1511, it is located in the Vatican's Apostolic Palace in Vatican City. The fresco depicts a gathering of philosophers, scientists, and intellectuals from classical antiquity set in an architectural space reminiscent of a grand Roman basilica. The central figures in the composition are Plato and Aristotle, symbolizing the two major schools of thought in ancient philosophy. Surrounding them are other notable figures such as Socrates, Pythagoras, Euclid, and Ptolemy, representing various branches of knowledge. Amerigo Vespucci was an Italian explorer, navigator, and cartographer who lived from 1454 to 1512. He is best known for his expeditions to the New World, which led to the recognition and naming of the continents, of course, North and South America. Vespucci made several voyages to the Americas between 1497 and 1504, during which he explored the coastlines of South America and parts of Central America. His accounts of these voyages, particularly his letters describing the geography and the peoples of the New World, were widely circulated in Europe and contributed to the European understanding of the Americas. In 1507, the German cartographer Martin Waldseemuller named the new continents the Americas in Vespucci's honor. Galileo Galilei, born in 1564 in Pisa, Italy, was a Renaissance scientist, mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher. He is often referred to as the father of modern observational astronomy, the father of modern physics, and the father of science, due to his numerous contributions to the fields. To be overly simple on this complex topic, Galileo's support for the Copernican heliocentric model brought him into conflict with the Catholic Church, leading to his trial and condemnation by the Inquisition in 1633. Paradise Lost is an epic poem written by the English poet John Milton, published in 1667, so maybe a bit after the Renaissance era we typically assume, but it tells the biblical story of the fall of man, focusing on the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, as described in the book of Genesis. The poem begins with Satan's rebellion against God and his subsequent expulsion from heaven, followed by his plotting to corrupt humanity. It then shifts to earth, where Satan tempts Adam and Eve to disobey God, leading to their expulsion from paradise. A Midsummer's Night's Dream is a comedic play written by William Shakespeare, believed to have been composed around 1595 or 1596, set in Athens and the surrounding forests. The play follows the intertwining romantic escapades of four young lovers and a group of amateur actors who become entangled in the mischief of fairies. The central plot revolves around the wedding celebrations of Theseus, the Duke of Athens, and Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, which the Amazons were a race of warrior women in Greek mythology and where the rainforest ultimately gets its name from. It remains one of Shakespeare's most beloved and frequently performed comedies as well. Canterbury Tales are a collection of stories written by Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 14th century. The narrative of the tales follows a group of pilgrims journeying from London to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket in Canterbury Cathedral. To pass the time on their journey, each pilgrim tells a story. Chaucer's use of vernacular Middle English and his characterizations make the Canterbury Tales a seminal work of English literature, though they remained unfinished, unfortunately. For our final entry on Tier 2, we have the Counter-Reformation, also known as the Catholic Reformation. It was a period of Catholic revival that took place in response to the Protestant Reformation, beginning in the mid-16th century. The Counter-Reformation sought to address the criticisms and challenges posed by Protestant reformers and to strengthen the authority and the unity of the Catholic Church. Key elements of the Counter-Reformation included efforts to reform the clergy, combat corruption and abuses within the Church, and reaffirm Catholic doctrine and practices. The Counter-Reformation also involved the founding of a new religious orders, such as the Jesuits, who played a crucial role in missionary work, education, defending Catholicism against Protestantism, and more. Additionally, the Counter-Reformation saw the use of art and architecture as tools with elaborate churches and artworks designed to inspire piety and devotion among the faithful. The Counter-Reformation succeeded in reinvigorating the Catholic Church and stemming the spread of Protestantism in many parts of Europe. Beginning Tier 3 of the iceberg, we have the Commercial Revolution. The Commercial Revolution was a period of economic expansion, trade growth, and commercial innovation that took place in Europe during the late Middle Ages and the early modern period, roughly from the 11th to the 18th centuries. It was characterized as significant changes in trade practices, banking, finance, and the emergence of a global economy. Key developments of the Commercial Revolution included the rise of banking and financial institutions, the expansion of trade routes, including the reopening of overland trade routes to the Middle East and exploration of new sea routes to Asia and the Americas, and it also saw the emergence of joint stock companies, maritime insurance, and other forms of commercial organization to facilitate long-distance trade. The increased availability of goods and the growth of consumer markets transformed European and world society. The medieval renaissances refers to periods of cultural, intellectual, and artistic revival that occurred during the Middle Ages. 
These renaissances were characterized by renewed interest in classical learning, literature, and art, as well as advancements in science, philosophy, and technology. While they may not have reached the same level of cultural and intellectual impact as the renaissance of the 14th to the 17th centuries, they were still periods of advancement. An example of one of these is the Carolingian Renaissance during Charlemagne's reign from the 8th to the 9th century, characterized by a revival of classical learning and the establishment of centers of scholarship. Sandro Botticelli, born Alessandro di Mariano di Vanni Felipepe, was an Italian painter of the Florentine school during the early Renaissance. He is best known for his iconic works such as The Birth of Venus and Primavera. His works exemplify the ideals of beauty, harmony, and humanism that were central to the Renaissance. Despite his successes during his lifetime, Botticelli fell into obscurity after his death until his rediscovery in the 19th century. On the Workings of the Human Body is a treatise written by Andreas Vesalius, a Renaissance-era anatomist and physician, published in 1543 under the Latin title De Humani Corporis Fabrica. It revolutionized the study of human anatomy and marked a significant advancement in the field of medicine. Vesalius's work departed from the traditional reliance on ancient texts and relied instead on direct observation and dissection of human cadavers. The book features detailed illustrations of the human body, created by talented artists, accompanied by Vesalius's meticulous descriptions of anatomical structures and functions. The Lives of the Artists is a biographical work written by the Italian Renaissance artist and historian Giorgio Vasari, first published in 1550 with expanded editions in 1568. It is considered one of the foundational texts of art history. In The Lives of the Artists, Vasari provides biographical accounts of prominent artists from the Renaissance period, including painters, sculptors, and architects. He offers insights into their lives, their works, their techniques, and their contributions to the development of art. The Bibliotheca Corviniana, established in the 15th century, was one of the most renowned libraries of the Renaissance era. It was commissioned by Matthias Corvinus, the King of Hungary, and housed in Buda, now part of Budapest. The library contained a vast collection of manuscripts, codices, and printed books, numbering around 2,000 volumes at its peak. The Bibliotheca played a significant role in the cultural and intellectual flourishing of the Renaissance in Hungary attracting scholars and humanists from across Europe. It served as a center for learning, scholarship, and the dissemination of knowledge, contributing to the spread of Renaissance ideals in Central Europe. William Byrd was an English composer of the Renaissance era renowned for its significant contributions to music. He was one of the foremost composers of his time, known for his mastery of polyphony, basically individual parts that fit and harmonize with each other, and his innovative compositions. Byrd's work include masses, motets, anthems, and keyboard music, and as a Roman Catholic living in Protestant England, Byrd faced religious persecution, but he continued to compose and publish music throughout his life. Lorenzo di Medici, also known as Lorenzo the Magnificent, was an Italian statesman, de facto ruler of the Florentine Republic, and a prominent patron of the arts during the Renaissance. As the head of the powerful Medici family, Lorenzo wielded significant political influence in Florence, and he played a crucial role in maintaining the city's stability and prosperity. Lorenzo was also a passionate supporter of humanist ideals and a patron of the scholars, artists, and writers, including Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Botticelli. His patronage helped to foster a cultural and artistic renaissance in Florence, earning him the title, The Magnificent. Hugo van der Goes was a Flemish painter of the Northern Renaissance, and he was active in Belgium, and his paintings often depicted scenes from the life of Christ and the Virgin Mary. Van der Goes's most famous work is the Portinari altarpiece commissioned by Tommaso Portinari, an Italian banker living in Bruges. The altarpiece is renowned for its intricate detail, vibrant colors, and emotional intensity. The Prince, which we kind of basically already covered, was written by Niccolo Machiavelli and was a political book dedicated to Lorenzo di Medici. It is considered one of the most influential works of political philosophy in Western literature. In The Prince, Machiavelli offers advice for how rulers should rule. He advocates for pragmatism, realism, and the use of force and manipulation when necessary to achieve one's political goals. The sack of Rome occurred in 1527 when troops of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, primarily composed of mutinous German soldiers, invaded and plundered the city of Rome. The sack lasted for several months and resulted in widespread destruction, looting, and violence. The soldiers, who had not been paid for their wages, vented their frustration and anger by ransacking churches, palaces, private residences, and more, seizing treasures and committing acts of brutality against the civilians. The sack had profound repercussions for the city of Rome and the Catholic Church, as it marked a significant blow to the prestige and authority of the papacy. The event also contributed to the decline of the Italian Renaissance and the rise of the Counter-Reformation. The Last Judgment refers to a religious theme in Christian theology and art, depicting the final judgment of humanity by God at the end of time. In Christian doctrine, the Last Judgment is believed to be the moment when all souls, living and dead, are judged by God according to their deeds and granted either salvation or damnation. 
In art, the Last Judgment has been a popular subject since early Christian times and has been depicted in various forms, including paintings, sculptures, and murals. One of the most famous depictions of the Last Judgment is Michelangelo's fresco on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel in Vatican City. Dr. Faustus is a play written by the English playwright Christopher Marlowe, believed to have been first performed in the early 1590s. The play tells the story of a scholar named Dr. Faustus who makes a pact with the devil, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasure. Faustus conjures the demon Mephistopheles and engages in a series of magical experiments, but ultimately faces damnation for his sinful actions. Tiziano Vicelli was an Italian painter of the Venetian school during the High Renaissance, aka the Late Renaissance, and he is considered one of the greatest painters of all time and a leading figure of the Venetian Renaissance. Vicelli's work spans a wide range of genres, including religious paintings, mythological scenes, portraits, and landscapes, and his art had a profound influence on subsequent generations of painters, including Peter Paul Rubens and Diego Velazquez. The Lamentation is a common theme in Christian art depicting the mourning and the lamentation of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. It typically shows the body of Jesus being mourned by his followers, Mary, and other disciples. The scene often takes place at the foot of the cross or in a tomb, and it has been a popular subject in religious art for centuries, inspiring numerous paintings, sculptures, and other works of art across differing cultures and periods. Michelangelo Marisi, better known as Caravaggio, was an Italian Baroque painter renowned for his revolutionary approach to art and his dramatic use of light and shadow. He pioneered the use of chiaroscuro, a technique that emphasized stark contrast between light and dark to create dramatic effects and heightened realism. He died at the age of 38 under mysterious circumstances, but his artistic legacy endured, influencing generations of artists and leaving an indelible mark on the development of Baroque art. Neo-Stoicism was a philosophical movement that emerged during the Renaissance, particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries as a revival of Stoicism, an ancient Greek philosophy. Neo-Stoics sought to adapt Stoic principles to the Christian context of their time and to apply them to everyday life. Central tenets of Neo-Stoicism included the belief in the importance of self-control, rationality, and virtue in achieving inner peace and contentment. Neo-Stoics emphasized the need to accept and endure life's challenges with equanimity regardless of external circumstances. The movement attracted intellectuals, scholars, and statesmen across Europe who were drawn to its emphasis on moral integrity and personal resilience. The Old Hall Manuscript is a collection of English sacred music dating from the early 15th century. It is one of the most important sources of English medieval music, containing a diverse range of compositions including motets, mass settings, and secular songs. The manuscript is named after the Old Hall of the Abbey of St. Edmundsbury in Suffolk, England, where it was discovered in the 19th century. Next up, we have someone, and in general a topic that I wish was covered more in icebergs like this, uh, Hernan Cortez, the full name Hernando Cortez de Monroy y Pizarro Altamirano, was a Spanish conquistador who played a pivotal role in the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire in the early 16th century. Born in Medellin, Spain, Cortez studied law before joining the Spanish military, and in 1519 he led an expedition to Mexico where he made alliances with the native Indios opposed to Aztec rule and eventually conquered the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in 1521. Cortez's conquest of the Aztec Empire was marked by military prowess, political maneuvering, and interesting tactics, including the capture and seizing of the Emperor Montezuma. After the conquest, Cortez became the governor of New Spain, present-day Mexico, where he oversaw the colonization of the region by the Spanish crown. Love Labor's Lost is a comedic play written by William Shakespeare, believed to have been first performed in the late 1590s. The play follows the King of Nevada and three of his noblemen who swear an oath to devote themselves to three years of study, fasting, and avoiding contact with women. However, their plans are disrupted when the Princess of France and her ladies-in-waiting arrive on a diplomatic mission. Romantic entanglements ensue as the men find themselves falling in love with the women they vowed to avoid. It remains one of Shakespeare's lesser-known works. Dundo Morohe is a comedy play written by Croatian Renaissance playwright Martin Drizic, believed to have been first performed in the early 16th century, set in the city of Dubrovnik. The play follows the misadventures of the titular character, Dundo Morohe, and the plot revolves around Dundo Morohe's attempts to marry off his adopted daughter, a young and beautiful woman named Kate. However, complications arise when various suitors, including a miserly old man and a boastful soldier, vie for Kate's hand in marriage. Also, my apologies for the probably bad pronunciations here, and also probably in the entire iceberg in general. Toppler House, also known as the Toppler Theater, was a historic building located in Gorlitz, Germany. It was a prominent theater and cultural center in the city known for its distinctive neo-Renaissance architecture. The building was constructed in the late 19th century and served as a venue for theatrical performances, concerts, and other cultural events. Unfortunately though, the Toppler House was heavily damaged during World War II, particularly during the Allied bombing raids on Gorlitz in 1945. 
After the war, the building fell into disrepair, and despite efforts to restore it, it was ultimately demolished in the 1960s. Today, it's a park. Before I start this entry, uh, real quick, there's going to be like one or two more Chinese entries on this iceberg. I'm not totally sure why, though. I'm not against it, but... Romance of the Three Kingdoms is a classical Chinese historical novel attributed to Luo Ganzong, believed to have been written in the 14th century during the Ming Dynasty. The novel is set during the turbulent period of the Three Kingdoms, AD 220 to 280, in ancient China and is based on historical events and figures from that era. It follows the power struggles and military campaigns among warlords and factions as they vie for control over the fragmented empire. For our last entry on Tier 3, we have the theater. The theater was the name of the first permanent public playhouse in London, England, and it was built by the English actor and entrepreneur James Burbage in 1576 in Shoreditch, London. It was a polygonal shaped building with a thatched roof and could accommodate up to 500 spectators at once. The theater hosted performances of plays by famous playwrights of the time, including William Shakespeare and more. In 1599, the lease for the land on which the theater stood expired, leading to a dispute between Burbage and the landowner. In response, Burbage and his company dismantled the theater and used its timbers to build the Globe Theater on the south bank of the River Thames. The Globe Theater became one of the most famous theaters in London and the primary venue for productions of Shakespeare's plays. Beginning Tier 4 is the Timurid Renaissance. The Timurid Renaissance refers to a period of cultural, intellectual, and artistic flourishing that occurred in the Timurid Empire in the 15th century. The Timurid Empire, which was centered in Central Asia and encompassed parts of modern-day Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan, was founded by Timur, Tamerlane, in the 14th century. The Timurid Renaissance was characterized by advancements in architecture, literature, calligraphy, miniature paintings, and scientific scholarship. The Timurid Renaissance had a lasting impact on the cultural heritage of Central Asia and the broader Islamic world. Francis Bacon was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, and author who played a key role in the development of modern scientific inquiry and the philosophy of empiricism. He is best known for his promotion of the scientific method, which emphasized observation, experimentation, and induction as the basis for acquiring knowledge about the natural world. Bacon's most famous works include Novum Organum and The Advancement of Learning, in which he outlined his philosophical and methodological ideas. Bacon served as Attorney General and Lord Chancellor of England under King James I, and he was a leading figure in English politics and intellectual life during the early 17th century. On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres is a work by the Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus and was published in 1543. It presented a heliocentric model of the universe challenging the geocentric model that had been dominant since ancient times. Copernicus proposed that the Earth and the other planets revolve around the Sun, rather than the sun and other celestial bodies revolving around the earth, as was previously believed. This revolutionary idea laid the foundation for modern astronomy and revolutionized our understandings of the cosmos. The Farnese Hours is an illuminated manuscript. It was created in the early 16th century for the Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who later became Pope Paul III. It is considered one of the most exquisite examples of Renaissance manuscript illumination. The Farnese Hours contained a collection of prayers, devotions, and psalms arranged for use throughout the liturgical year. It is preserved in the Bibliotheca Apostolica Vaticana in Vatican City, where it continues to be admired. Domenico de Piacenza was an Italian dance master and choreographer during the Renaissance period. He is renowned for his contributions to the development of dance in Italy and is considered one of the pioneers of early Renaissance dance. Domenico de Piacenza is best known for his treatise, De Arte Satandi et Curius Ducendi, or On the Art of Dancing and Conducting Choreography, which was written around 1455 and is one of the earliest known dance manuals in Western history. The Copernican question refers to the debate and the controversy surrounding the heliocentric model of the universe proposed by Nicholas Copernicus in his work on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. The Copernican question sparked intense debate among scholars, theologians, and philosophers of the time, as it raised fundamental questions about the nature of the cosmos and humanity's place within it. Critics of Copernicus's theory, including prominent figures like Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei, faced opposition from the Catholic Church and traditional Aristotelian philosophy, which held sway over scientific thought at the time. The Hospital degli Innocenti, translated as the Hospital of the Innocents, is a historic building located in Florence, Italy, designed by the renowned architect Filippo Brunelleschi. It was constructed between 1419 and 1445 and is considered one of the earliest examples of Renaissance architecture. The building was originally founded as an orphanage for abandoned children, particularly those born to unwed mothers, and served as a charitable institution dedicated to the care and welfare of infants. Today, the Ospedale degli Innocenti serves as a museum and cultural center, showcasing its history and architectural significance. 
The Adoration of the Magi is a religious motif depicting the scenes of the three wise men or magi presenting gifts to the infant Jesus as described in the Gospel of Matthew. The Adoration has been a popular subject in Christian art for centuries and has been depicted in various forms including paintings, sculptures, and illuminated manuscripts, among others. The scene is often set against the backdrop of a stable or manger with Mary, Joseph, and other figures witnessing the event. The Adoration symbolizes the recognition of Jesus as the Savior and King of the world by people of different cultures and backgrounds, and it is celebrated as an important event in the Christian liturgical calendar, particularly during the Christmas season. Some notable artistic depictions of the Adoration include works by Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci. Johann Carolus was a German publisher and printer who was credited with publishing the world's first newspaper. In 1605, Carolus began publishing a weekly news publication titled account of all distinguished and memorable news, which was printed in Strasbourg of the Holy Roman Empire. This publication provided readers with updates on current events, politics, and other noteworthy occurrences, and although earlier forms of news dissemination, such as handwritten newsletters and single-sheet publications existed, Carolus's newspaper was the first to be produced regularly and distributed to a wider audience. The War of Urbino, also known as the Urbino Crisis, occurred in the early 16th century and was a conflict between the Papal States and the Duchy of Urbino. The war was sparked by tensions between Pope Julius II and Duke Francesco Maria della Rovere of Urbino over control of the strategically important region of, you guessed it, Urbino in central Italy. The conflict escalated in 1502 when Julius II launched a military campaign to annex Urbino and asserted papal authority over the region. The fighting continued for several years with both sides engaging in sieges, skirmishes, and battles throughout the territory. Though eventually in 1508, Julius II succeeded in conquering Urbino, installing his nephew, Lorenzo II de' Medici, as the new ruler. Mountains or Planine is considered to be the first Croatian novel, written by Peter Zoranic in 1536 and published posthumously in Venice in 1569. The story tells about a poet's imaginary seven day journey across Croatian mountains on which he embarks in order to forget his love and his miseries, and it is also composed of 24 chapters. The Renaissance Men Were Rivals talks about Renaissance men, men who were proficient in multiple different things, take being good at archery, painting, sculpting, etc., for example, and this theory says that they were rivals and competed with each other. While these Renaissance figures often collaborated and shared ideas, they were also sometimes rivals, competing for patronage, recognition, and influence. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, two figures of the Italian Renaissance, were known to have a competitive relationship. They both sought commission from wealthy patrons and vied for supremacy in their respective fields of art and engineering. Similarly, in the realm of science and philosophy, there were rivalries between figures such as Galileo Galilei and Johannes Kepler, who competed to develop new theories and models explaining the workings of the universe. Jean Fouquet was a French painter and illuminator who was one of the most important artists of the 15th century in France. He is known for his contributions to both panel painting and manuscript illumination, and he played a crucial role in the development of the French Renaissance style. Fouquet's style combined elements of Flemish realism with French elegance, and he was celebrated for his skillful use of color, light, and perspective. One of his most famous works is the Melon Diptych, a portrait diptych commissioned by Etienne Chevalier, treasurer to King Charles VII of France. He is considered a key figure in the transition from the medieval to the Renaissance style in French art as well. Despite his significance, much of Fouquet's life and career remain shrouded in mystery, and many aspects of his biography are still debated by art historians today. The Two Mona Lisa thesis is a theory proposed by art historian Lillian Schwartz in the 1970s. She suggested that Leonardo da Vinci created two versions of the famous painting, with the second version being a mirror image of the first, and according to Schwartz, da Vinci used a technique called mirror writing to create the second version, which she claimed could be seen when the painting was placed in front of a mirror. Schwartz's theory is based on her analysis of the composition, proportions, and details of the painting, as well as her experiments with computer imaging techniques. However, her theory has been widely criticized and rejected by most art historians, and the overwhelming consensus among scholars is that there is only one authentic version, which is housed in the Louvre Museum in Paris. The Mona Lisa as we know it today, though, and many other paintings of the era, are paint-overs or have underpaintings behind them which shows what original concepts or ideas were there. The Dancing Plague of 1518 was a mysterious phenomenon that occurred in Strasbourg, Alsace, modern-day France, during the summer of 1518. It involved a sudden outbreak of compulsive dancing among hundreds of people, leading to a bizarre and chaotic situation. The dancers, mostly women, were reported overcome by an uncontrollable urge to dance, and they continued to dance for days or even weeks without rest. The Yangul Encyclopedia, also known as the Yangul Dadian, is one of the largest encyclopedic works in the history of China. It was commissioned by the Yangul Emperor Zhu Di in the Ming Dynasty and compiled between 1403 and 1408. The encyclopedia was an ambitious project aimed at systematically documenting all known knowledge of the time. 
and consisted of 22,877 manuscript rolls and covered a wide range of subjects, including philosophy, history, literature, art, medicine, science, and more. The Yangon Encyclopedia was organized into a comprehensive system of categories and subcategories with entries arranged alphabetically within each section, and it was written by a team of scholars and supervised by the eunuch official Zhang He. Despite its monumental size and scope, only a few manuscript copies of the encyclopedia were produced, and none have survived to the present day. Yet another thing from the medieval iceberg is the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, and it was a list of banned or highly frowned upon books by the church. It was in effect for a long while, and it still sort of retains a moral stance on books, though it does not necessarily ban them, and it's just a list for Catholics to be wary of when reading. The Book of Common Prayer is a foundational text in the Anglican Christianity Church. It contains liturgical rites, prayers, and theological statements of the Church of England and other Anglican churches worldwide. It was first compiled by the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer in the mid-16th century during the English Reformation and has undergone numerous revisions since then. The Book of Common Prayer provides a framework for worship, including services for daily prayers, Sunday worship, Holy Communion, baptisms, weddings, funerals, and other rites. From what I can tell, Portrait of a Young Man is a common title for a genre of paintings found throughout art history depicting youthful male subjects, though this iceberg says it's lost, so I'm not totally sure. But these portraits often showcase the individual in a dignified and introspective manner, highlighting their physical features, attire, and facial expressions. Artists from various periods and cultures have created portraits of young men, each reflecting the stylistic and cultural norms of their time. Examples include the works of Renaissance masters like Raphael and Titian, who depicted young men with a sense of grace and idealized beauty. Though, if you have any idea what this entry is about, feel more than free to let me know. Henslow's Diary is a valuable historical document from the Elizabethan era, offering insights into the theatrical world of Renaissance England. Compiled by Philip Henslow, a prominent theater owner and entrepreneur in London, the diary provides detailed records of theatrical performances, financial transactions, and other aspects of everyday theater business during the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Henslow's diary contains entries related to the production staged at the Rose Theater and other venues associated with them. The diary sheds light on the practicalities of theater management and popularity of different plays and genres, along with the economic challenges faced by the theater company. Vasco Núñez de Balboa was a Spanish explorer and conquistador who played a significant role in the early exploration and the conquest of the Americas. In 1513, Balboa led an expedition across the Isthmus of Panama, becoming the first European to sight the Pacific Ocean from the New World. He claimed the ocean and all its shores for the Spanish crown, thus opening the way for further exploration and colonization of the western coast of South America. Balboa's discovery of the Pacific Ocean was a milestone in European exploration, as it confirmed the existence of a vast ocean separating the continents of the New World from Asia, though they did not know exactly how big it was. But, however, Balboa's success was short-lived. He was later accused of treason and executed on the orders of the Spanish governor of Darien, Pedro Arias de Avila, in 1519. Also, Ferdinand Magellan knew him. Not sure why Magellan is not on this list, to be honest, either, but he was the first man to lead an expedition to successfully circumnavigate the globe, though he died along the way, and only a handful of the original crew of a couple hundred managed to make it and survive. The Comedy of Errors is one of William Shakespeare's early comedic plays, believed to have been written in the early 1590s. It is one of Shakespeare's shortest plays, and it is based on the Roman playwright Plautus's Menachme, and the play revolves around the theme of mistaken identity and revolves around two sets of identical twins, separated at birth, who find themselves in the same town unbeknownst to each other. The confusion that arises from their uncanny resemblance lead to a series of humorous situations, but eventually, the twins are reunited with their respective family members and all misunderstandings are resolved. Yet another thing mentioned in the medieval iceberg is the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is an enigmatic and mysterious codex believed to have been created in the early 15th century. It is named after Wilfred Voynich, a rare book dealer who acquired the manuscript in 1912, and the Voynich manuscript is written in an unknown script with illustrations depicting botanical, biological, astronomical, and cosmological subjects. Despite numerous attempts by scholars, cryptographers, and linguists, the text of the manuscript remains undeciphered, and its origin, purpose, and authorship are still the subject of speculation and debate. And again, I highly recommend the Histocrat video on this because I cannot do the whole manuscript justice here. The Theatrum Orbis Terrarum consisted of a collection of maps compiled from various sources, including Artelis' own surveys and those of other cartographers. These maps were accompanied by descriptive texts, making the atlas a comprehensive geographical reference work. The Theatrum Orbis Terrarum played a pivotal role in advancing the study of geography and map making during the Renaissance, and is regarded as a landmark in the history of cartography. The School of Night was an informal intellectual circle that existed in Elizabethan England during the late 16th century. 
It was named after English poet and scholar Sir Walter Raleigh, who was a prominent member. The School of Knight comprised a diverse group of individuals, including writers, scholars, scientists, and philosophers, and the exact membership of the School of Knight remains somewhat unclear. The School of Knight met in private gatherings to discuss literature, philosophy, science, and politics, often engaging in debates and exchanging ideas on a wide range of topics. And that's basically all, because a lot of it is still shrouded in mystery. St. John the Baptist, also known as John the Baptist, is a key figure in Christianity. According to the New Testament, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus and is said to have baptized him in the Jordan River, marking the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. John is described as a charismatic preacher who called people to repentance and baptized them as a sign of their commitment to God. He's also believed to have foretold the coming of the Messiah and played a crucial role in preparing the way for Jesus' ministry. And as he relates to this iceberg, I can only assume it's about him being portrayed in art. The seven deadly sins originating from Christian theology represent moral transgressions that include pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth, and these sins are viewed as the root of other vices and moral failings, leading individuals away from virtue and spiritual well-being. Each sin is characterized by an excessive desire or attitude detrimental to oneself and others, such as arrogance, selfishness, or laziness, and the concept of the seven deadly sins served as a framework for moral reflection and they were popular and still are in ways during the Renaissance era and even before that too. Also, side note, when you search up seven deadly sins art, it's going to be challenging to find art about the actual sins because you're bombarded with a all the bunch of anime stuff. I don't know. Francois Villon was a French poet and one of the greatest lyric poets of the late Middle Ages. He's best known for his collections of poems titled The Testament in English, which showcases his wit, humor, and keen observations of the human nature. Villon's poetry reflects his tumultuous life that was marked by poverty, crime, and exile, and he frequently wrote about themes of love, death, and the fleeting nature of life, inserting into his work senses of melancholic dread and existential angst. Despite his troubled life and brushes with the law, Villon's poetry earned him acclaim and recognition among his contemporaries. His influence extended beyond his own lifetime, too, inspiring later generations of poets and writers into the Renaissance. The Imitation of Christ is a classic Christian devotional book written by the German-Dutch monk Thomas A. Kempis around the early 15th century. It is divided into four books and offers practical guidance on how to live a devout Christian life. The work emphasizes the importance of humility, self-denial, and spiritual discipline, urging readers to follow the example of Jesus Christ in all aspects of their lives. The Imitation of Christ has been widely read and cherished by Christians of various denominations for centuries, and it continues to be regarded as one of the most important spiritual books in Christianity. The Overtari Chapel, located in the Church of the Aramitani in Padua, Italy, is renowned for its remarkable frescoes and architectural design. Commissioned by the Overtari family in the 1440s, the chapel is a masterpiece of Renaissance art. The frescoes depict scenes from the life of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and various saints. The chapel is considered one of the finest examples of Renaissance art in northern Italy and attracts visitors from all over the world. The Geneva Bible is an English translation of the Bible that was first published in 1560 in Geneva, Switzerland, and it was produced by English Protestant exiles who had fled to Geneva during the reign of Queen Mary I of England, known as Bloody Mary, due to her persecution of Protestants. The Geneva Bible was the first English Bible to be divided into chapters and verses, a feature that has since become standard in most translations. It was also the first English Bible to include extensive study notes and commentary, making it a valuable resource for understanding scripture. The Geneva Bible was immensely popular among English-speaking Protestants and played a significant role in shaping English religious and literary culture during the Elizabethan era. It remained in widespread use until the publication of the King James Version in 1611. Fulgens and Lucrece is a moral interlude written by the English poet and statesman John Lydgate, composed around 1496. It is a dramatic allegory that explores themes of virtue and vice, and the power of love. The play follows the story of Lucrece, a virtuous woman and her husband, whose actions are influenced by the personifications of vice and virtue. Through a series of moral lessons and encounters with various allegorical figures, the play emphasizes the importance of choosing virtue over vice and the consequences of moral choices. Fulgens and Lucrece reflects the medieval traditions of morality plays, which were popular during the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, and aimed to instruct audiences on moral and religious themes. La Navidad, besides being Christmas in Spanish, was a Spanish fort that Christopher Columbus and his crew established on the northeastern coast of Hispaniola, located in what is now Haiti. La Navidad was the first European colony established in the New World during the Age of Discovery, although it was destroyed by the native Taino people the following year. Columbus called the port Puerto de la Navidad, Christmas port, the day he landed there. Today, there is no conclusive evidence on the exact spot of the settlement, and debates on where it was located are still pretty common. The Bishop's Ban of 1599, also known as the Bishop's Bible Ban, 
refers to the decree issued by the English bishops in 1599 to prohibit the printing and distribution of unauthorized editions of the Bible. The decree was a response to the growing popularity of nonconformist or Puritan translations of the Bible, which were seen as a challenge toward the authority of the established Church of England. The most notable of these unauthorized translations was the Geneva Bible, which contained extensive notes and commentary reflecting Puritan theology and views on church governance. The Winchester Manuscript, also known as the Winchester Anthology, is a medieval manuscript containing a diverse collection of English literature from the late 14th and the early 15th centuries. It is named after Winchester College, where it was housed for several centuries before being acquired by the British Library. The manuscript is significant for its rich and varied content, which includes works of poetry, prose, religious texts, and historical documents. One of the most famous works found in the Winchester Manuscript is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, a Middle English romance poem that is considered one of the finest examples of Arthurian literature. For our final entry of Tier 4, which was a huge tier, is Cardenio. Cardenio is a lost play attributed to William Shakespeare and his collaborator John Fletcher. It is believed to have been written around 1612 and is based on the character Cardenio from Miguel de Cervantes' novel Don Quixote. The play tells the story of Cardenio, a young nobleman who is betrayed by his friend and lover, leading to a series of tragic events. Despite his popularity during Shakespeare's lifetime, Cardenio has not survived in any complete form, and its exact content and structure remain a subject of mystery. However, fragments of the play do survive, as well as references to his performance. Cardenio is often cited as one of Shakespeare's lost plays, and efforts to reconstruct or adapt the work have continued into the present day. Beginning Tier 5, we have the Renaissance Continuity Thesis. This thesis posits that the Renaissance was not a complete break from the Middle Ages, but rather a period of continuity and gradual evolution from medieval traditions. According to this thesis, many aspects of Renaissance culture, including art, literature, philosophy, and science, were rooted in earlier medieval developments and were shaped by ongoing cultural, intellectual, and social trends. While the Renaissance is often characterized by its emphasis on humanism, individualism, and the revival of classical antiquity, proponents of the continuity thesis argue that these elements were present to some extent in medieval Europe and were further developed and expanded upon during the Renaissance. It suggests that the Renaissance should be understood as part of a broader historical continuum rather than as a distinct and isolated phenomenon. The first mention of psychology as a distinct field of study can be traced back to ancient Greece, particularly to the philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle. While the term psychology itself was not used in the modern sense, these early philosophers explored questions related to the human mind, consciousness, and behavior. Plato, for example, discussed the nature of the soul and its relationship to the body in works such as Phaedo and the Republic. Aristotle, often regarded as the father of psychology, wrote extensively on topics such as perception, memory, emotion, and learning. I'm not totally sure how this one relates to the Renaissance, though feel free to let me know if you know how. Next up, we have Charlemagne's Manifestos. Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, was a prominent figure in medieval European history who ruled as King of the Franks. He later became Holy Roman Emperor in 800, the first one, and there's no record of him issuing manifestos in the modern sense of the term. However, Charlemagne did issue various decrees, charters, and legislative documents known as capitularies, which were intended to govern his realm and regulate aspects of governance, law, and administration. These covered a wide range of topics, including land tenure, taxation, justice, religious affairs, and education, and it's a bit early to be included in the Renaissance iceberg, I think. La Galatea is a pastoral novel written by the Spanish Renaissance author Miguel de Cervantes and published in 1585. It is considered one of Cervantes' early works and is divided into two parts. The first part of La Galatea consists of six books and follows the adventures of a group of shepherds and shepherdesses in the pastoral setting of the Montes de Toledo in central Spain. The novel combines elements of romance, adventure, and pastoral poetry and explores themes of love, friendship, and more. However, there is no second part of La Galatea. Cervantes had originally planned to write a continuation of the novel, but never completed it. Instead, he focused his efforts on other literary projects, including his most famous work, Don Quixote. Leonardo da Vinci researched dead bodies. While this far down on the iceberg is not a mystery or anything obscure for that matter either, the renowned Italian Renaissance polymath was known for his insatiable curiosity. As part of his extensive anatomical studies, Leonardo indeed researched dead bodies, primarily through dissection, both human and animal. His anatomical sketches and notes found in his famous notebooks reveal detailed observations of the skeletal, muscular, circulatory, and nervous systems, among others. Emodi, also known as The Positions or The Sixteen Pleasures, was a notorious work of erotic art created during the Italian Renaissance. It consisted of a series of explicit engravings depicting various positions, accompanied by sonnets describing each. The engravings were originally commissioned by the Italian noblewoman Isabella d'Esti and created by the artist Marcantonio Ramondi in 1524. However, the work quickly gained notoriety for its explicit content and was suppressed by the church, leading to the arrest of Ramondi and the destruction of many copies. 
The End Town Plays, also known as the Ludus Coventry, or Coventry Cycle, are a collection of medieval English mystery plays dating back to the late 15th century. These plays were performed by craft guilds in the town of Coventry, England, as part of religious festivals and celebrations, particularly during the Feast of Corpus Christi. The End Town Plays encompass a wide range of biblical stories, from the creation to the Last Judgment, and were intended to educate and entertain audiences while conveying moral and theological messages. The plays were performed in cycles, with each guild responsible for staging a particular episode or series of episodes. While the original manuscript of the End Town plays have not survived, they were transcribed and preserved in later manuscripts. Thomas Nash's The Isle of Dogs is a play written by the Elizabethan playwright Thomas Nash in collaboration with Ben Jonson. It was performed in 1597, but was quickly suppressed by the authorities due to its politically and socially controversial content. The play was set on the Isle of Dogs, an area near London, associated with prostitutes and crime and it contains satirical and inflammatory references to contemporary politics and figures in the government. The play was deemed seditious and offensive, leading to the arrest of Nash and Johnson, as well as the closure of the theaters which it was performed. Consequently, the Isle of Dogs was lost to history, and no copies of the original text have survived. Despite its controversial reputation, the play remains a subject of fascination for scholars. La Idea dell'Architettura Universale, The Idea of Universal Architecture, is a treatise written by the Italian architect and theorist Vincenzo Scamozzi, first published in 1615. In this influential work, Scamozzi expounds his comprehensive vision of architecture as a universal and harmonious art form that encompasses both theoretical principles and practical applications. He outlines his ideas on architectural design, including proportions, aesthetics, and construction techniques, drawing upon classical principles and contemporary innovations. Scamozzi's treatise emphasizes the importance of unity, order, and symmetry in architectural composition, reflecting the ideals of the Renaissance and Baroque periods. Gran Cavallo, also known as the Great Horse, was a colossal equestrian statue commissioned by Ludovico Sforza, Duke of Milan, from the renowned Renaissance artist da Vinci in the 15th century. The statue was intended to be the largest equestrian monument of its time, standing over 7 meters, or 24 feet tall, and cast in bronze. Leonardo meticulously designed the Gran Cavallo, studying the anatomy and movement of horses to create a lifelike and dynamic representation of one. However, due to various challenges, including the outbreak of war and the scarcity of bronze, the statue was never completed during Leonardo's lifetime, and in 1499, the bronze intended for the statue was used for military purposes, and Leonardo's clay model for the Gran Cavallo was destroyed by French troops. Da Vinci was known for not finishing a lot of his commissioned works as well. The dissolution of the monasteries was a series of administrative and legal actions against Catholics initiated by King Henry VIII of England in the 1530s. The dissolution involved the confiscation and dismantling of monastic institutions, including monasteries, nunneries, and friaries throughout England. This process was part of Henry VIII's broader campaign to assert royal supremacy over the church in England and to consolidate his power and wealth. The monastic properties and assets seized during the dissolution were redistributed to the crown or sold off to nobles and wealthy landowners contributing to the enrichment of the royal treasury and the secular elite. The dissolution had profound consequences for English religious and social life. It also paved the way for the English Reformation and the establishment of the Church of England as the national church, independent of papal authority. Adam on Paradise refers to a dramatic work that was began but never completed by John Milton, which was intended as a sequel to his epic poem, Paradise Lost. In this unfinished play, Milton planned to depict the events following Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, exploring their experiences and interactions in the fallen world. While Milton's intentions for this work are known, from his notes and outlines, the actual text of the play remains incomplete with only fragments and drafts surviving. The Pazzi Conspiracy was a failed coup attempt against the Medici family, led by the Pazzi family, in 1478. The plot was orchestrated by members of the Pazzi family with the support of Pope Sixtus IV. The conspiracy culminated in the assassination attempt on Lorenzo de' Medici and his brother Giuliano during Mass at the Florence Cathedral on April 26, 1478. During the attack, Giuliano de' Medici was killed, but Lorenzo escaped with minor injuries. The conspirators planned to take control of the city quickly unraveled as the Florentine populace rallied in support of the Medici, and the Pazzi family members involved in the plot were swiftly apprehended and executed. The failure of the Pazzi conspiracy solidified the Medici's family's grip on the power in Florence and led to a brutal crackdown on their political rivals. The event also had significant repercussions beyond Florence, straining relations between the city-state and the papacy, and contributing to broader political instability in Italy during the Renaissance. The Jewel of Vicenza refers to the Teatro Olimpico, the Olympic Theater, located in Vicenza, Italy. Designed by the Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio in the late 16th century, it is considered one of his masterpieces and a symbol of the city's culture. The theater is notable for its semicircular seating arrangement and a stage set known as the Sene Franz, which resembles ancient Roman architecture. The interior is adorned with elaborate frescoes, creating an illusion of depth 
and the Teatro Olimpico is the oldest surviving indoor theater in the world. The Wars of the Roses were a series of dynastic conflicts that took place in England during the late 15th century between the rival houses of Lancaster and York. The wars were characterized by a series of battles, political intrigues, and shifting alliances between the Lancastrian and the Yorkist factions, culminating in the establishment of the Tudor dynasty under Henry VII in 1485. The most notable battles of the wars include the battles of Towton, Barnet, and Bosworth Field, and the wars resulted in significant political upheaval and social turmoil in England, leading to the eventual consolidation of power under the Tudor monarchs and the end of the Plantagenet dynasty. I highly recommend the book The Wars of the Roses by Dan Jones. Uh, it explains the complex wars really well. The Bonfire of the Vanities was a historical event that occurred in Florence, Italy in 1497. It was a religious and political event organized by the Dominican friar Girolamo Zavonarola, who had risen to prominence as a preacher advocating for moral and religious reform. The bonfire involved the burning of various items considered sinful or frivolous, including books, art, cosmetics, and other luxury goods. However, the Bonfire of the Vanities also led to widespread censorship and the destruction of valuable cultural artifacts, sparking controversy and resistance among Florentine citizens. The Sibylline Book, or the Book of Sibyls, is a medieval German manuscript dating back to the 12th century AD. It's a compilation of prophecies attributed to various sibyls or mythical prophetesses from classical antiquity. These prophecies were often interpreted as predicting future events, including the coming of Christ and the end of the world. The Sibylline Book contains a collection of poetic verses, prose passages, and illustrations depicting scenes from the lives of the Sibyls and their prophetic visions. Again, I'm not totally sure why this high-slash-early-late medieval thing is on the list, but still cool nonetheless. The Castle of Perseverance is a medieval morality play believed to have been written in the early 15th century. It is one of the earliest surviving English morality plays, and it is notable for its allegorical depiction of the struggle between good and evil for the soul of mankind. The play centers around the character of mankind, who is tempted and led astray by vices such as worldly wise and fleshly lust. However, with the guidance of characters such as good angel and penance, mankind ultimately finds redemption and achieves salvation. And a morality play is just a genre of medieval and early Tudor drama that imparts moral lessons while entertaining the audience. These plays feature personified concepts, often virtues and vices, alongside angels and demons too. The Marprelate Controversy was a theological and political dispute that occurred in England during the late 16th century, specifically between 1588 and 1589. It revolved around a series of anonymous pamphlets known as the Marprelate Tracts, which were critical of the Church of England and its hierarchy. The tracts were written in a satirical and often inflammatory style, attacking bishops and clergy for perceived corruption, hypocrisy, and abuses of power. The controversy escalated as the authorities attempted to suppress the distribution of the tracts, leading to arrests and prosecutions of suspected authors and printers. Despite efforts to uncover the identity of the Marpolet authors, they remain anonymous, adding to the intrigue and mystery surrounding the controversy. The Shakespeare authorship thesis is a long-standing debate in literary circles regarding the true ID of the author behind the works attributed to William Shakespeare. While the majority of scholars accept William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon as the rightful author, a minority posits alternative candidates such as Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, or Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. Advocates of alternative theories often point to perceived inconsistencies in Shakespeare's biography, the absence of manuscripts in his handwriting, and the complexity of the works as evidence for their claims. However, mainstream scholarly consensus overwhelmingly supports Shakespeare's authorship based on historical records, contemporary references, and textual analysis as well. Love Labors One is a title that has intrigued scholars and Shakespeare enthusiasts for centuries as it appears in lists of Shakespeare's plays, but no surviving copy has been found. Some scholars believe that Love Labors One may have been an alternative title for one of Shakespeare's known works, possibly Much Ado About Nothing or The Taming of the Shrew. Others suggest that it could be a lost play altogether, with no surviving manuscripts or records. It's just one thing in the many, many Shakespeare mysteries. The Grammarians' War, also known as the War of Spanish Secession, was a conflict that occurred in the late 17th and early 18th centuries in Europe. It was primarily fought between two coalitions, the Grand Alliance, led by England, Austria, and the Dutch Republic, and the Bourbon Alliance, led by France and Spain. The war was sparked by disputes over the succession to the Spanish throne and concerns among European powers about the balance of power on the continent. The Grammarians' War saw a series of military campaigns and battles across Europe and its colonies, resulting in significant loss of life and widespread devastation. The conflict finally ended in 1713 with the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, which established a new balance of power in Europe and marked the decline of Spanish influence as a major European power. Again, a little late to be included in this iceberg, though I assume it's here because the history and the factors behind this war are rooted in the Renaissance, kinda. The Miracle of 1511 was a festival in Brussels in which the locals built approximately 110 snowmen, and of these, more than half of the snowmen portrayed lewd characters. Snowmen built were a snowman that was seducing another snowman, a snowman and a snowwoman having, you know what, in front of a town fountain, and a snowboy peeing. 
Locals decided to use the snowmen to protest, and the different classes each constructed different kinds of snowmen, rich and poor, and the poor would destroy snowmen built by the ruling classes. Eventually, the miracle ended when the snow melted during the following spring, which led to flooding in Brussels, though about 100 snowmen causing flooding, I'm not totally sure, I guess that's where the miracle comes in at. And later that month, when the water was gone, the King of France donated 1,000 gold coins to the town. For our last entry of Tier 5, we have the Lamentation foreshadows the Renaissance. The Lamentation, a subject depicted in various artworks throughout history, including paintings and sculptures, is a religious scene portraying the mourning and lamentation of Christ's body after the crucifixion. While it primarily holds religious significance, some scholars argue that the themes and artistic techniques employed in Lamentation artworks foreshadowed elements of the Renaissance. For instance, the emphasis on human emotion and expression, as well as the attention to anatomical detail in depicting the human form. Additionally, the use of perspective and composition in Lamentation artworks demonstrates a growing interest in realism and spatial representation, characteristics that would become defining features of Renaissance art. Thus, while the Lamentation remains rooted in religious tradition and times before the typical Renaissance era we think of, its artistic portrayal seemingly hints at the innovations and advancements that would come to define the Renaissance period as a whole. For our final tier, Tier 6, we are beginning it with the Isidorian Renaissance. The Isidorian Renaissance refers to a period of intellectual and cultural revival that occurred in the Iberian Peninsula during the reign of the Visigothic king, Isidore of Sevilla. Isidore was a prominent cleric and scholar who played a significant role in promoting learning and education throughout his Visigothic kingdom. Under his patronage and influence, a flourishing of scholarship and intellectual activity took place, characterized by the preservation and dissemination of classical knowledge, as well as the production of original works in theology, philosophy, science, and literature. Isidore's most famous work is the Etymologi, an encyclopedia that synthesized a wide range of classical and Christian learning, serving as a compendium of knowledge for scholars in the Middle Ages. The Isidorian Renaissance laid the groundwork for the cultural and intellectual achievements of the later medieval period in Spain, contributing to the development of a distinctive Iberian intellectual tradition. Descriptio Urbis Romae, Latin for Description of the City of Rome, is a term used to describe literary works, maps, or illustrations that provide detailed descriptions of the City of Rome, its landmarks, and its historical significance. Throughout history, various authors, historians, and artists have created descriptions of Rome, offering insights into the city's layout, architecture, topography, cultural heritage, and more. These descriptions often serve as a valuable source for understanding the urban development of ancient Rome and later on to the Renaissance and beyond, as well as its role as the center of the Roman Empire. It can take the form of writings, art, basically anything that helps to describe Rome, and they still kind of exist today. The Ur Hamlet, meaning basically the original Hamlet, is a hypothetical play believed to have preceded William Shakespeare's famous tragedy, Hamlet. While no definitive evidence of the Ur Hamlet's existence exists, scholars speculate that it may be an earlier version or source material from which Shakespeare drew inspiration for his own play from. References to an earlier Hamlet appear in historical documents, including records from the Elizabethan era, and some scholars suggest that the Ur Hamlet may have been written by Thomas Kidd or another contemporary playwright of the era. The existence of the Ur Hamlet remains a subject of debate and speculation among Shakespearean scholars as well. The Parnassum of Luis Vaz refers to literary works of Luis de Camoas, a celebrated Portuguese poet of the Renaissance period. Camoas is best known for his epic poem, Os Lucidiadas, the Lusiads, which recounts the Portuguese voyages of discovery and celebrates the nation's maritime achievements. Os Luciadas is considered one of the greatest works of Portuguese literature and a masterpiece of epic poetry, and in addition to Os Luciadas, Camoes wrote numerous other poems, sonnets, and lyrical compositions, many of which are collected in anthologies or compilations known as Parnassums. Paragranum is a work by Paracelsus, the Renaissance physician, alchemist, and philosopher. This work is one of Paracelsus's most important writings and is considered a foundational text in the history of alchemy and medicine. In Paragranum, Paracelsus expounds his revolutionary theories on the nature of diseases, health, and the human body, challenging traditional medical practices and advocating for a more holistic approach to healing. He introduces concepts such as the archaeus, a vital force within the body responsible for maintaining health, and discusses the use of minerals, plants, and metals in medicinal remedies. The Romance of the Devil's Fart, or Le Romain de Peu Diable, sorry for my probably bad French, is not a specific literary work, but rather a satirical phrase used to describe comical situation or absurd stories. In French, roman is a play on the word Roman, which basically means novel or romance novel, while Peo Diable translates to basically fart of the devil. This expression may be used to describe something ridiculous, nonsensical, or far-fetched, and it's often employed in a lighthearted or humorous context. Caravaggio was a serial killer is a speculative theory that lacks conclusive evidence from what I could find. Caravaggio, the renowned Italian Baroque painter, lived in the late 16th and the early 17th centuries and is celebrated for his innovative artistic style and dramatic use of light and shadow. And while Caravaggio's life was marked by incidents of violence and confrontations, particularly his involvement in fights and the like, 
There's no definitive historical proof to support the assertion that he was a serial killer that I could find. Instead, the sensationalized notion of Caravaggio as a serial killer is often based on conjecture and a sensationalized interpretation of historical anecdotes. Other than that, I could not find much evidence on this theory at all. Next up, we have Ugder Erin, and before starting this, I'm very sorry in advance for my awful pronunciations of Gaelic. Ugder Erin was a work by the Irish author Doubletack Mac Ferbisai, and only fragments of it still survive. It's a missing work, and the first draft and portions of it are the only remaining things that are mentioned from other sources, and the author, Ferbisai, was one of the last traditionally trained Irish Gaelic scholars and is known largely for his history and genealogies. Other than that, I cannot find much about Ugder Erin, and if you know anything else, please feel free to let me know. Next up, we have Rome almost went bankrupt. During the Renaissance, Rome faced significant financial challenges, but it did not almost go bankrupt in the modern sense of bankruptcy. The city's finances were often strained due to factors such as costly building projects, military campaigns, and the patronage of the arts by the papacy and wealthy families, and popes such as Leo X incurred substantial debts to fund their lifestyles and artistic endeavors, leading to financial difficulties for the papal treasury. However, Rome's financial troubles were typically managed through measures such as increasing taxes, borrowing money, etc., rather than facing bankruptcy. Despite these challenges, Rome remained a center of wealth, power, and culture during the Renaissance, and other than that, all the bankruptcy theory claims are about ancient Rome and mostly their early republic. The Hockney-Falco thesis, formulated by artist David Hockney and physicist Charles M. Falco in the early 2000s, proposes that optical devices, particularly the camera obscura, which is basically a box where images with the use of light are projected onto surfaces, were utilized by Renaissance artists to achieve remarkable realism and perspective in their paintings. The thesis suggests that artists such as da Vinci, John von Eyck, and more may have employed these optical aids to project images onto their canvases, allowing them to trace outlines and capture intricate details with unparalleled precision. According to Hockney and Falco, the use of optical instruments could explain the extraordinary lifelike quality observed in certain Renaissance artworks. Some question the validity of the Hockney and Falco thesis and argue that it oversimplifies the complexities of artistic creation. Others have embraced it as a groundworking theory that sheds new light on the methods employed by Renaissance artists. Though, it is possible to create lifelike pictures or paintings without such tools and people of the era were more than capable of doing that. Still, it is an interesting theory nonetheless, and Camera Obscura is a cool object to look into otherwise. For our very last entry on this entire iceberg, we have Pope Leo X made elaborate plans for a crusade. The Medici Pope, who reigned from 1513 to 1521, was fervently dedicated to the idea of launching a crusade during his papacy. Believing it to be a pivotal opportunity to reclaim Jerusalem and other holy sites from Muslim control, Leo X meticulously orchestrated elaborate plans for his ambitious military campaign. His vision for the crusade extended beyond religious fervor. He saw it as a means to assert papal authority and unite European Christian kingdoms against the Ottoman Empire's expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean as well. Leo X engaged in extensive diplomatic efforts to garner support from European rulers and forged alliances with influential leaders such as Emperor Maximilian I and King Francis I of France. Despite his strategic maneuvering and fervent appeals, Leo X faced significant challenges in realizing his crusade ambitions. Financial constraints, political rivalries, and the outbreak of conflicts in Europe thwarted his plans, ultimately leaving his crusade aspirations unfulfilled. Nevertheless, Leo X's relentless pursuit of a crusade underscored his commitment to the papal mission and his aspirations for a united Christian front against threats in the East. Alright everyone, that about does it for this iceberg. Um, I truly appreciate all the support I've gotten recently, and if you stuck around to the end, thank you for that too. I think this iceberg is a good sequel to the medieval mystery iceberg I did. It's undoubtedly better put together and more coherent, I think. I know last video I said I probably wasn't going to do an iceberg as my next video, but I got caught up when I saw this one and thought it was cool, so I just worked on this one. But there is a non-iceberg video coming soon, plus more icebergs in the works too, of course. Yeah, if you want to subscribe, that's cool. If not, that's also cool too. Just thank you for watching. Any support is much welcomed. Um, I will see you guys sooner rather than later, I hope. And thank you and have a great day, all you beautiful people.